This is part three in my series on own voices, so let's not waste any time and just get into it. So I've mentioned someone named Kat Rosenfeld before. She's a young adult author who wrote this vulture piece about toxic YA Twitter, which is an amazing piece. And she also wrote a piece called What is hashtag own voices doing to our books? And in this piece, she shares information from people anonymously. For example, she shares the experience of a young adult author who had recently sold a debut novel to one of the big five traditional publishers who said that an agent had asked them whether they had a history of mental illness because their book was about a character with mental illness. So Own Voices has become the genesis of these awkward and inappropriate conversations between writers and their editors and agents. And she supports what this other article says that hashtag Own Voices extends to everything from medical conditions to sexual orientations. So authors describe feeling compelled to either reveal private information in order to assert their right to tell a given story or feel that they have to abandon the material entirely. Kat Rose Rosenfeld shares a Twitter message from an aspiring author and someone who is LGBTQ+, who said that, according to the principles espoused by this movement, to have my story be appreciated, I'll need to make myself unsafe. I'd have to sell myself to sell a book. I'm going to go more into Kat's piece in just a bit, but first I want to give some context about writing in the publishing industry that people may not know, both currently and historically. So I think there's this myth that the writer is just this like pure artist that just writes this story and then everything just works works out. No. Historically, there's always been issues with policing what is published and what is written, whether that was by people in power who didn't want you writing something that was, for example, unflattering about the king or about whatever other government that was in power. For a long time, a lot of people didn't have access to publishing their stories. Maybe at some point during the era of patronage, you'd be lucky enough to find a wealthy patron to support you, but you still had to make sure that you were keeping them happy with what you were writing, which is why there are some of William Shakespeare's sonnets that are thought to be written specifically because because of the patron that he was being supported by. If you look at Latin American countries, I believe it was Isabel Allende, but don't quote me on that. There's a Latin American author who described essentially being related to someone who was in the government that was in power. And then when the government change happened, having to burn their manuscripts and flee because otherwise they would be sent to jail or worse. In China, people definitely do not have the freedom to publish whatever they want. But again, that censorship comes from the government. For the most part, the historical trend in the West has been a continual democratization, so to speak, of the publishing process. It's gotten easier and easier to publish books to the point now that you can just self-publish a book in digital form or print on demand. A lot of people don't want to go that route, but that route is available to you. You can sell your books directly to your readers. You don't have to go through any kind of gatekeeper. Now, I'm not disparaging the writer's creative and artistic powers. And if you're a frequent viewer of this channel, you've heard me talk many times about how you need to write a good story. But the publishing industry is a business. If you are going to make money off of your work, if a publishing house is going to make money off of selling your work, then there needs to be an audience for it. And the downside to the democratization of the publishing process is that there's been a huge influx of content. And every book is not only competing with every other book that's being published, it's also competing with every other form of media for people's time and attention. Video games, movies, TV, of which we are also at an unprecedented era for that amount of content. So in the past, you would hear these stories about authors who were just these private people people, but that's not really a thing anymore unless you're at the top of the top. If you're a new author starting out, the publishing house needs you to be part of their marketing team because their marketing budget for all the books they have to publish is a finite one that is shared among all those books. And the publishing house will basically bet on which books they think it is worth their time to spend that marketing budget on. And the rest of the authors are just kind of left to their own devices. So especially in the YA and sci-fi and romance communities, I don't know as much about just contemporary adult fiction or literary fiction, but in those genres, you definitely need to be on Twitter promoting yourself. And the more that you can do to stand out, the better. That's just a key principle of marketing. How do you brand yourself? And so publishers and authors have seized on own voices as a way to distinguish the books and authors and say, hey, buy this book and not that other one. I think a lot of authors, once they encounter the unforgiving machine that is the publishing industry, often get really disillusioned. So many authors are just these creative types that have stories within them and they want to share 
share them with the world and they want to be compensated for their efforts. They are not business-minded people. They don't want to think about their work as a commodity that is being sold and marketed. But that is the reality. That is what we're talking about. That is the world that we live in and there is no going back. Like I said, because people have more access to publish their own work, people who want to write things that are really niche can find their audience, but they have to worry about their branding. They have to worry about their marketing. How do they help the people that are looking for the kind of book that they've written find them? But if you're the kind of author that just wants to write the book, submit it, sit back and watch everything happen, unless you're the most amazing writer of all time, it's not going to happen. Even if you go the big five route and don't self-publish, like I said, your percentage chance of actually getting a lot of effort put into your marketing and publicity is pretty low. So if things have changed from what I talked about in my video about Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, where she talks about how the true genius works of literature were the ones where you couldn't sense anything of the author in the work, like with Jane Austen's work and with Shakespeare's work. Now it is all about seeing the author in the book, that author having the identity connection to the characters that they are writing. So for the moment, that's where the publishing industry is at, but it can change. The publishing industry is constantly changing and publishers are entities trying to make money. So if some other trend comes along, if the own voices thing wears out its welcome, they'll move on to the next thing that they can use to brand their authors appropriately to get money from readers. Because like I said, it's a really crowded marketplace. I'm sure other readers can relate, but I've had experiences where, for example, I stopped reading historical fiction about World War II for the most part because I'd read so many of them and there were so many coming out that just sounded like the same story over and over with nothing fresh, even though there's not really technically any new stories, but that's a topic for another time. But I just got bored and so I've always been looking for something fresh, but I don't care who writes it. Like write a historical fantasy set in ancient China. I don't care who you are, just do your research. So going back to Kat Rosenfeld's piece about what hashtag own voices is doing to our books, she brings up the controversy surrounding Kosuko Jackson, who was set to publish a debut novel called A Place for Wolves, but was canceled for not being hashtag own voices enough. So what happened was the main character was gay and black like the author, so it was an own voices story, but it was set in war-torn Kosovo in the 1990s, and a Goodreads reviewer accused him of appropriating the setting that he was not qualified or entitled to write about. It was not his story to tell. And he decided to pull the book less than a month from publication, which means that it was a very costly choice, not just for him, but for the publisher who had to pulp the 55,000 copies of the book that had already been printed. He did not have to return his advance, which is standard, but I have no idea how much money his contract was worth. Usually payments are made in installments, so he forfeited any further installments. He made a statement after he pulled the book where where he wrote, I apologize to those I hurt with my novel. I vow moving forward to do better and use this opportunity to grow. The amazing thing about this story is that before this happened, he had made a tweet that said, quote, stories about the civil rights movement should be written by black people. Stories of suffrage should be written by women. Ergo, stories about boys during horrific and life-changing times like the AIDS epidemic should be written by gay men. Why is this so hard to get? And yet he decided to appropriate a historical moment that he was not qualified to write about. About. And when that tweet resurfaced in the wake of his self-cancellation, apparently one commenter responded, live by the sword, die by the sword. So Kat shares more anonymous messages that she got after this happened. Someone messaged her saying that when a gay black man writes about his own experience falling in love, he better choose the right backdrop for it or else. Only there is no right backdrop. They tantalize us with the possibility that if we just do enough research, if we hire enough sensitivity readers, if we go to enough diversity classes, it'll be enough. But it'll never be enough. Like I told you, nothing is ever enough for these people. She said with only one exception, everyone who shared thoughts and experiences with her for this piece requested anonymity for for fear of professional blowback. Kat Rosenfeld muses that things have changed dramatically in the YA space since The Fault in Our Stars, which was a hugely best-selling novel, which had a disabled female protagonist. Well, she was dying from cancer. I guess that makes her disabled. And obviously this protagonist had very little in common with the author, John Green. She doesn't mention this in the piece, but I know that his inspiration for that story was from his own experience working as a chaplain in a cancer ward, I believe. So it does come from his lived experience experience, although he is adjacent to the experience and so it's not own voices and blah, 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 blah. She says that according to the feedback she got, it's not uncommon to submit a labored over manuscript only to be dinged for making their characters the wrong sex or race. One such rejection sent to an aspiring writer whose story centered on a white female protagonist read, if you happen to write another book with a male protagonist, preferably hashtag own voices, I would be glad to read it. Having worked in the publishing industry in this space, that does not surprise me at all. And this author, 
Meyer decided to abandon writing young adult literature entirely, as well as to never submit to that agent again. And like I've discussed previously, often the gatekeepers who say that they are anti-racist allies have a certain picture of what marginalized people's stories should look like. So they pressure writers with these marginalized backgrounds to stick to writing issue books centered on oppression and injustice. And she quotes Francina Simone, who is a booktuber, a YouTuber who talks about books. I think it mostly refers to the young adult space, I'm not sure. But she is a booktuber and a young adult author who I actually have watched her videos and I appreciate a lot of her videos, which I will get into in a second. But her quote was, issues are important for sure, but damn, can a bitch be entertained? Can I be black and be entertained? Sometimes my blackness is a struggle, but that doesn't mean my whole life is. Imprints want those kinds of books, but it's feeding the crowd who wants, I don't want to call it trauma porn, but it kind of is. So she's one of the few booktubers that I could stand and I used to watch her. I don't agree with all of her views, like I don't agree with all of anyone's views. She did this video about harmful books. To summarize her video, she basically said that we shouldn't be telling other people what books they can or cannot read. And some books are harmful to specific individuals based on their own insecurities, trauma, etc. But that's their own shit that you can only curate your home library, not the world's library. And then we shouldn't be shutting down stories being written. You should just write your own stories if you don't like the stories that are being written. If you don't like the bisexual stories that are out there, write your own bisexual story. She says that art is something people put out there and people either like it or they don't. She also points out something that is actually really important, which is that the majority of young adult readers at this point, as far as I'm aware, are actually adults. And adults are throwing their insecurities onto their interpretations of these books. Even though I'm an adult, I feel like I still often am able to read with the mindset of what I was like when I was a teenager. Like I roll my eyes more at some of the romances for sure, or some of the stupid things that characters do. But I'm able to remember what it was like to be a teenager and make a distinction between, okay, this is just stupid because the author is not a very good writer and this is not really what teenagers are like versus this is exactly the kind of stupid thing a teenager would do or say or whatever. And I'll relate this back to something I said in my sensitivity readers video when I commented on Simon versus the Homo sapiens agenda, which was written by Becky Albertelli, the author who was forced to come out because who is she to be writing queer books? And there was that problematic passage with a comment about lesbianism being alluring to some people. And that's exactly the kind of thing a teenage boy, gay or not, would be thinking. And most of the Goodreads blowback is from adults, from what I can tell when I've looked into it. It's not from teenagers. I'm sure there are some out there, but that's really not where the majority of it's coming from. It's from adults. And that's a whole other topic that she's gotten into about how adults are ruining YA. So I honestly wonder what teenage readers think of these books versus the adults that probably, like me, started reading young adult novels when they were a teenager and just kept reading them. There's a misconception that all young adult is just trash and there are no good stories there. There are really good YA books that adults can enjoy as well. My father has read several young adult books on my recommendation and loved them and gotten extremely overcome by the emotions and invested in the stories. How my father, as an adult male, was able to relate to so many of the female protagonists in these young adult stories that I shared with him is beyond me because how can we even relate to characters that don't share our identity? Do you know what I'm saying? But he did. He did relate to them and enjoy them. There are trash young adult books and good ones just like in every other genre. So I don't have a problem with adults reading YA books. The only problem that comes up is this whole cancel culture, Goodreads, Twitter mob thing that happens. And I will conclude with a quote from Kat Rosenfeld's piece from a 20 year veteran of YA publishing who wrote to her in an email, quote, do those writers not see the artistic dead end they are creating for themselves? And Kat says that yes, taken to its logical conclusion, this approach to storytelling will set strict and claustrophobic limits on imagination, confining authors according to an ever narrowing concept of which identity, settings, or narrative are their own. So I hope you have come away from this content about own voices with a better understanding of what an own voices book is, where it came from, why people support the concept, the problems that it has caused, and a slightly better understanding of the way the publishing industry operates and how all of that's come together to create the situation that authors are in right now. Like I mentioned, pretty much no one that she quoted in her piece wanted to use their real identity because the professional 
blowback and blacklisting is real, as you will know if you're a fan of this channel, because I've talked about my own personal fears to that effect. Like I said in the sensitivity readers video, I really don't know what's going to happen to change it. I recommend that if you can find authors who are public about having controversial views to figure out who publishes them and which agency represents them and submit there. It's not an easy problem to solve because even if agents decide to represent the books, they still have to find an editor who is willing to go to their editorial board and say, we should spend money on this book because it's going to make us money. Because it's really hard to make your mark as an editor and especially when you're starting out, you may not have the clout necessary to advocate for a book that might be considered problematic enough to incur blowback from the Goodreads outrage mob and the book blogger outrage mob because then you might have to cancel the book, pull it before publication, lose money, lose reputation points, etc. So it's this whole interconnected web of terribleness. Maybe I will think more about this topic and if I have more inspired and uplifted thoughts to share about my hopes for the future, I will. All that I can say is to repeat what I said about things can always change, publishers are going to follow the trends, so if what's trendy changes, then publishers will follow. Publishers follow the culture, they don't create it, so I guess we got to fight the culture wars, y'all. I also just want to make a quick comment that technically libertarians are an underrepresented group in literature, as far as I'm aware, but I'm pretty sure that if I tried to write a character, even a female one, that identified as a libertarian, I just have this feeling like people would not be so eager to represent that novel. Just a hunch I have. Anyway, thank you for sticking with me. I know that was a lot. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. DM me on Twitter, send me an email, whatever floats your boat. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I will have more content for you very soon.